Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. A very warm welcome to the latest episode of our Keys webinar, our monthly broadcast to our clients around the world. We're delighted to have you with us uh, today. Those of you who've been with, been with us before on these sessions will know that each month we take a topic that seems pressing and relevant to our clients, wherever you may be, uh, and try to look at it from a number of different angles. And that's what we're going to try to do again today. This time we're going to talk about generations. We think this is a topic that merits further study and debate. And uh, we've been working at Ipsos on a report for our clients, which we hope will help you think about the topic in whatever context and with whatever challenges you're facing. So we're going to present highlights from this report and some new analysis that we've been uh, doing today. And uh, I'm doing that with my wonderful colleagues, uh, a panel of experts from around the world. So really pleased to have you all with us. Um, Gita is going to uh, share with us her perspective, her analysis, thinking about Generation Z or Gen Z, depending on how you like to look at these things and in particular have a look at whether they're the first global generation so Geeta's with us from Bangalore today or this evening because it's already uh, half past eight uh, so thank you for being with us Geeta. We're then going to be uh, with Jinnah who is based in Seoul where it's midnight so thank you for being with us uh, Jinnah and Jinnah is going to help us understand the dynamics of Korea's greying economy and the lessons there for us all because uh, a greying economy is probably coming to our country sometime soon if it hasn't already and sticking on the more senior elements not our speaker of course who's Colin in Philadelphia today but Colin has been doing some great work to help us better understand uh, more older consumers and to help us think about the different perspectives and different dynamics there I'm talking to you today from London, so I'm going to kick off with some reflections on demography and why it is our destiny. But before I do that, I would just wanted to remind um, you that we're really looking forward to your questions. So please, uh, any any questions or observations you have, put them in the chat. Some time at the end of the webinar uh, to talk with our panel uh, and ask any questions you've got, and of course we can follow uh, up with the conversation afterwards as well. So just to kick off. Um, Demography is destiny. Increasingly, when we're doing presentations around uh, generations, we start with this topic because it just feels like it's the critical starting point before you get into the details. When I was uh, at secondary school in the late 1980s, we were studying demography in our geography lessons. We were looking at population pyramids and we explored, for example, the implications of war on different age uh, cohorts and age profiles and what that meant for the population. We started to study things uh, in terms of how populations changed over time, looking at something called the demographic transition model. And I'm advised it's still there in geography lessons. But it's also here right now in politics because governments around the world are struggling and thinking through how best to fund and protect their pension system, their health system as countries age. Italy in particular, if I'm looking at Europe, has the most extreme population profile in many ways, nothing like what we learned at school. Uh, and there Italy's new government has, for example, put in place some measures uh, to encourage people to have more babies, more children. We'll come on to that topic during the webinar. Demography isn't just for the politicians to worry about, it's for all of us in business to really think about where we are heading. Italy, for example, is projected to uh, move from 59 million to 52 uh, million by the year 2050. Uh, and other countries, France, potentially may just about stay stable. Germany, likely to see uh, a fall. And so we're starting to have to ask ourselves questions around what does it mean to have fewer consumers, fewer customers, fewer citizens, fewer workers. Many countries around the world are starting to find out. The list of those who are experiencing population decline this year is at least 30. Many of them are in Eastern Europe, but of course we have China and Jenna is going to share with us the South Korea story a little bit uh, later on. So really poses the question for us, 
if we're in business, if we're thinking about uh, brands and consumers and trends, are we prepared for what is about to happen if it hasn't started to happen already in our country? Because if we look at the fertility rate for the world's top 10 economies, you'll notice that in none of them does it reach the figure of 2.1. That's the figure that you need in terms of keeping your population stable, assuming everything else remains the same. Uh, all uh, the countries in the top 10 are not making that level. And it really raises big questions about where we're heading, political questions, but also business questions. If we're in business, we need to ask ourselves, are we on top of these numbers to the extent that we should be? We all love talking about Generation Z. Uh, in Ipsos, in our Knowledge Centre, this is the most searched for topic by our colleagues. And if we look at the business press, we can find no shortage of articles telling us about what Generation Z are or aren't. Uh, some of them uh, perhaps aren't based on the greatest and most robust evidence, but it's out there. There's lots of buzz, lots of hubbub about Gen Z. Now, in the United States, Gen Z are the biggest single generation, if I'm looking at them in terms of raw population uh, numbers, but you'll notice it's only just. Uh, if I go to China, uh, I'll notice that millennials are the biggest single generation. We'll come on to look at generations in much more detail in a moment. Uh, if I go to Japan, it's the boomers who are the biggest a single group and Colin will be looking at that in more detail with us because this is a pattern in many parts of the world already. Look at Europe uh, overall or Italy or Germany. This is the group which is the biggest in numbers and as we'll look at later they have many many resources, financial resources and uh, uh, other resources as well. So what are our building blocks for generational analysis? Just a couple of just introductory remarks from me, and Geeta's going to pick up on this uh, a little bit more um, in a moment. But um, when we're thinking about analysing, uh, let's say, survey data, um, it is potentially helpful to have some strong and common definitions that we're using. And, and these have become uh, widely used uh, around the world. There are some caveats, and the, the generational terms have been subject to some quite significant criticism and, and the, the letter that was written, uh, the open letter in the Washington Post uh, written to the Pew Research Center is well worth reading because it raises some questions about how generations are being analyzed. Now, we aren't going as far as it says on the headline at Ipsos. We think generational analysis is a really good way of helping us understand why and how change happens. But we do need to be careful. One of the areas we need to be careful about is overgeneralizing and just saying, just comparing the four generations in a nice, easy, shorthand way, because quite often the reality is more complex than it might seem. That's one of our findings of the year when we're looking at um, public opinion data around the world in 2024, uh, is the differences we see within Generation Z by gender. Uh, and increasingly, we're finding uh, those differences are bigger than they are between uh, the generations. It's a topic we're going to come back to more in the coming months, but it's just a bit of a marker for us to be a little bit careful about over-generalizing. Second point, again, a bit of a marker against over-generalizing, is always to think about the context. Consistently, we have to remind ourselves that when and where you were born matters in terms of your outlook, in terms of your experiences. Uh, um, for example, different countries had baby booms at different times. So a reminder that using the term baby boomer may be shorthand, but it might not be exactly what happened in your country. Similarly, we do need to be very careful about the language and labels. Perhaps we're, we've got too many value judgments in talking about Gen X. That might be one uh, reason for taking care. But another one might be that we just need to break out and be a bit bolder. And it might actually be the case that for a particular piece of work, I'm not really thinking about it in generation terms. I'm thinking about it, about people between 40 and 59. That's my target age group. And I'm going to really look at them in real detail. So uh, I think we would certainly be encouraging you to feel free uh, to break out of any constraints that might be coming into play when you're doing generational analysis. I think the other finding that we 
uh, have observed, still thinking about this point about context, is whether other people have a shared understanding of what we're talking about, if we're researchers or marketeers, when we're talking about generations. So you'll no doubt be pleased to know that we've done a survey on this topic uh, in 29 countries, asking people uh, about which generation they think they're in. And one of the things that we find is a great deal of variety. In the US, there is a relative degree of uh, awareness. Uh, the percentage of Americans who correctly, inverted commas, identify which generation uh, they're in uh, is reasonably high, particularly among the older age groups. But across the other 28 countries, uh, not so much. 34% uh, on average are able to uh, correctly tell us which uh, generational uh, cohort they fall into. Uh, and certainly the terms aren't necessarily um, that well known in China and in India, for example. Um, uh, not so many people have heard of the term Generation Z, but it's barely 50% uh, across all of the countries. So just a reminder, if we're talking about generations, that might be fine, so long as we're all clear and we all know what we're talking about in business, but uh, it may not be common language outside the walls of where we work. Final point about the analysis, and this is where I'm going to start to hand over to, to Gita, but to do this kind of work well, we do need data. And one of the big caveats is uh, that we rarely have all the data, all of the information that we would like. Um, so ideally, we'd have longitudinal data that tracks people at individual uh, level uh, over time. Um, we rarely have that. Sometimes we have some survey data, some tracking data that goes back in time, but maybe not as far as we like. And even when it does go back a long way, uh, it may not be um, quite the questions that we are asking today. So you certainly uh, have to be, I think, careful about the data that we've got. But as we know, we do have an increasing number of data sources at our disposal. And um, it's certainly the case that we are increasingly able to ask some questions, I think, in quite a nuanced way, and at least get us on the track to starting to answer those questions. And that's really where uh, I hand over to our next speaker, because Gita has been thinking about this question about whether Generation Z are the first global generation. Gita, thanks for being with us, and uh, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Simon. Hello, everyone. Um, just as Simon said, everyone loves to talk about Gen Z. And uh, what we're going to uh, look through a little bit is if over the uh, decades, generations are becoming more and more alike across the globe. So do we have a sense of the emergence of a global generation? Even though when people normally talk about generations, there is an implication that these definitions hold good across countries. Whether you're talking about Argentina or Korea, a Gen Z characteristic is something that you would tend to define commonly. Um, and there's been a lot of critique. And despite all of that, um, it continues to be a popular topic and it continues to be one of the questions that we are often asked by our clients. So what is this amazing allure of uh, generations? If you think about it, um, if you could tap into the values and mindsets of a generation, you actually lock them in for a lifetime. <clears throat> And what's even better is that by looking at certain unifying themes that appeal to a cohort, a generational cohort, you are able to actually capture the attention and, and you know, address the needs of people across cultures. And this is what makes the idea of a generation so valuable. Uh, but we at Ipsos do know that it's it's not as simple as that, and there has to be care uh, when you examine topics such as this. And so what, what I'm going to do is two things. One is I'll help you unpack some of these concepts and give you some kind of a ready reckoner as to how can you uh, isolate, identify generational effects, global generational effects. And then I'll quickly walk you through some of the data that we have to examine if truly the newer generations are converging in that sense and becoming truly global, uh, as a matter of fact. So to start with, let's look at 
uh, how do we uh, conclude about generational differences? Typically, one is comparing bar charts such as this and making comments about oh, Gen Z being uh, different from boomers and millennials. But what we really need to also recognize is between these comparisons is comparison of groups which happen to be at very different life stages. And so you are comparing Gen Z who have not even seen 30s yet with older people who may have different priorities, concerns dictated by where they are at their life stage. And therefore to identify true generational effects, you will need to compare two generations at almost the same or similar age groups. And that's where, like Simon mentioned, you need long-term data. The other thing is, by implication, most of these definitions are supposed to be global. And therefore, you need to see, are you seeing the same patterns in different cultures? When you compare data of differences between generations, are you seeing similar things across different countries? And in a sense, that's what you have to do. You have to match patterns and ideally you have to isolate the true generational cohort effects. Now, if and typically even with Ipsos, we don't have such long term data, uh, then there is an alternative. Maybe the patterns that you see correspond to the larger vectors of change that are happening around us. And that is what is informing and shaping the minds of generations as they're coming. Uh, things such as digital connectivity, ideas such as sustainability, the fact that the very nature of work is changing, uh, broader stroke themes such as commercialization. These could be at play when we say things like our, our Generation Z far more responsible consumers? Is Gen X the one with the better work ethic and so on? So that's one way of doing this. Uh, in sum, when you're looking at generational comparison, first thing you need to do is match patterns and see if you see some kind of common patterns across uh, countries. You don't see in, in case of the left-hand side graph, but you do see it in case of the right-hand side graph. So in a simple way, are these patterns recurring across culture? And secondly, could you relate some of these changes to some kind of a consistent global vector or something that's causing change globally? That's the essence of uh, uh, you know what I recommend would be a good way to examine true generational differences. So we try to do something similar for Gen Z across three dimensions, con consumer attitudes, their work mindsets, and uh, social life that they have. And um, here is broadly what we found. Firstly, on the aspect of commercialization, we do find older generations attach a much higher value to things which are produced at home as compared to things produced outside, whereas younger generations are more open to consumption outside of home and therefore open to things such as the cafe culture. Again, there was a there is a belief or a myth that you know younger generations are far more responsible consumers. Um, we do find that ideas such as brand activism appeal more to the younger generation. They do care about what a brand does beyond its uh, you know, immediate provision of products or service. They do mind if it is socially responsible or not. But when you look at how they behave themselves as consumers, by their own admission, they are not necessarily more sustainable or ethical as compared to the other generations. We don't see a consistent pattern there. So even this idea of more responsible consumption with Gen Z, not necessarily true. They're supposed to bring completely different radical attitudes to work. Is this true? Yes, to an extent. For them, workplace has to incorporate elements such as me time, a chance to catch up with their colleagues and so on. So it's a place where you enjoy as much as where you work. Again, they do see a lot of value in switching jobs early. They're not going to be the kind who will sign up and stay with an employer for their extended career. Uh, at the same time, it isn't as though they're looking for completely different things when it comes to evaluating a prospective employer. Uh, for instance, uh, it, it, it isn't as though 
uh, the employer's impact on community matters a lot more to Gen Z than it does to the other generation. So in this, we see certain patterns. At the same time, it's not truly uh, sitting fit with some of the flat stereotypes that are offered. Again, this is a generation which is social media native, super connected, yes, maybe, but they're also the generation which reports the highest level of loneliness. They say also that they have so many commitments, they find it hard to socialize. And at the same time, somehow they don't seem to hold technology responsible for this kind of a disconnect or decline in the quality of human relationships. So in effect, what we do see is some evidence of change which can be thought to be generational, but we also see that in enough places, the context, the local cultural factors are at play. Again, not many things correspond with the stereotypes that are attached to these generations, particularly Gen Z. And it really calls for a very nuanced understanding of the changes that we are seeing. And, and a need to interpret them far more carefully than rely on uh, lazy cliches and perhaps rely only on long-term studies before you make uh, such conclusion. So our advice would be caution. And on that cautious note, I'll hand you back to Simon. Thank, thank you, Peter. So, 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 so caution in, uh, it just in, your basic your advice is you know, really take care before you uh, let's say start to take to the stage and say this is exactly what's going on. Yeah, it's it's super tempting. It's it's one yeah. of the most attractive ideas that we have, and therefore it would seem very easy to make these conclusions. But I mean, unfortunately, data doesn't always support some yeah, of these yeah. big emotions. Yes, yes. So, so in a way, some of the, the headlines are a bit less exciting. A picture is starting to build, but we have to be careful and, and cautious. But that's, uh, that's yeah, life. Yeah, okay. very much so. But good. Well, talking of a picture that's starting to build, <laughs> we're going to come back to Gita before we finish uh, with your questions. A picture that's definitely starting to build is uh, in Korea. Uh, our Jinna is now tomorrow morning, uh, my time anyway, it's Friday morning for, for Jinna. So thank you again for being with us. But the, one of the things we wanted to learn from Jenna was the experiences of Korea, which, as you say, the growing economy. Uh, are we in crisis situation or do we have some golden opportunities ahead of us? So thank you for sharing your perspectives uh, with us. Over to you. So good morning, good afternoon and good evening for all over the world. So you heard from Gita about Generation Z and then maybe generational truths and myths from global perspective. So I would like to go more locally, you know, deep dive in the Korea, my native country, uh, and talk a little bit about aging economy and older generation. And as Simon already mentioned, uh, we, we could see whether it's super aging crisis can turn into golden opportunity in the future. So, thinking about the demographic cliff crisis, as you can see from the right-handed chart, Korean birth rate started to decline hugely, starting from 1995 with 1.63, and it's almost half decreased recently. Sweet. 0.78. So that makes Korea world low, uh, the country with world lowest birth rate, only half of OECD country average. And if you look, compare with other countries, it's even lower than Japan. In Korea, having kids has become a matter of choice, not a necessity. As you can see from the chart, three out of 10 are dink which means double income, no kids. And the trend is increasing. Why? Because more and more people, young people, they don't uh, want to sacrifice their time and money on raising children. Instead, they really want to prefer to focus on themselves and their happiness. If we bring this trend step further, 
I guess some of you may heard about DINKWAT. The cure DINKWAT means double income, no kids, and without all. So this DINKWAT lifestyle choice has become a global phenomenon all over the world. So you can observe it by searching the hashtag DINKWAT in TikTok or other social media platform. And some of snapshots are here. So, UN standard tell us that Korea is entering super Asian society and with 90% of people over age 65. And recent Korean news tell us that people age 70 or older outnumbers those in 20 for the first time in Korean history. And what are the underlying contexts behind this? First of all, of course, it's due to the increased life expectancy, the fact that people live longer. Secondly, it's because of the change in mindset, especially among young uh, people who have different view on the marriage and family life. They differ or uh, not choose to marry or have kids due to several reasons. First reason is rising cost of housing and also huge expense of raising children, which is a typical Korean uh, situation with really competitive society. This adds with uncertainty about the future. So as a result, aging population will pose a severe risk to Korea's economic growth. So recent Bloomberg article tell us that if this trend continues, Korean economic growth will fall down to 1.8% in the next decade and even lower in the later decades. So this is really, really gloomy, serious situation for Korea. And at this time, we can ask this question again. Is the aging economy a looming crisis or could become a blooming opportunity? I think it could become a blooming opportunity if we think forward and address the changing market dynamic really, really proactive way. So now in Korea, there is a new emerging power consumer group called YORD, which means young old. So they are typical, typically in their late 50s and 60s or over, so mostly baby boomers and partly Gen X. And they have greater buying power and their attitude toward age is quite different from previous generation, generation of seniors. So they are more numerous, healthier and wealthier than previous generation. And as you can see from the chart, their household spending is almost equal to younger generation nowadays, and it is projected to be even higher in the next decades. So how we can just explore blooming opportunities for this old customer group? I think from business perspective, we could approach have two dimensions to address this old economy. First dimension is addressing longevity with the enhanced physical well-being. But it goes beyond just health care and medical care because what senior wants is not only just to survive. They really want a sustainable and enriched living. So here, food and dietary care and financial care could be another good opportunity to address newly evolving longevity, longevity needs. On the other hand, we can think about to proactively embrace the loneliness, their desire to be socially connected and active and become still remain part of community even after retirement. And three main areas could be pet, leisure activities and beauty and fashion, to tackle loneliness and ensure their social well-being. So knowing these key opportunities, on the other hand, we also need to understand their deeply rooted emotional desire, their ambivalent attitude toward age. So 
it's ageless on one hand and age friendly on the other hand. So ageless means, as you all, uh, all of you be aware, reflects their desire to look, think, and live young without regard to age. In a word, it's like breaking the convention and stereotyping of aging. However, on the other hand, age friendly is also critical desire to be from to be free from the age-related barrier and hassles so that they have more special treatment and customized product and services. So we can see some of great example how some of Korean company were forced to proactively embrace these opportunities in different sectors by fulfilling both, uh, either ageless or age-friendly value. So in beauty and fashion category, New Balance in Korea has adopted ageless approach for their brand campaign under the theme of, of age inclusiveness. So they featured the famous fashion designer, Milano Na, who is uh, also a YouTube creator and really popular among young generation. The way they featured her was not only about her vibrant, vibrant and useful image from Outlook. It was more about her attitude and behavior, like young. On the other hand, also Starbucks in Korea, interestingly, they adopted ageless approach in their ESG-led community activities. So they linked leisure areas to help seniors to learn specialized uh, coffee making. And it was not only for fun, because they really wanted to enable seniors to learn new skills and maybe get a new chance for work. So this was also a great example of ageless approach for ESG-related activities. Another dimension in financial sectors, one of popular banking brand, NH Bank, adopted age-friendly approach for their customer experience under the theme of digital inclusion. What's interesting here is that they really developed a special mobile banking app with elderly friendly mode so that old people can easily get access and use the digital functionalities such as large font size, big buttons, and one-click mobile payment system. Actually, my mom is really, really fond of this service. She's loyal to NH Bank. And lastly, one of leading food and beverage company, CJ, has adopted customized food care for seniors by creating a special brand called Healthinery this way, they provided healthy meal kits and customized meal plan for senior customers for their dietary needs. So it's again, age-friendly approach. So in conclusion, the aging economy presents a golden opportunity for those friends who can proactively address the micro context and needs of elderly customers. And moving beyond business, I think we need to talk more actively about age diversity, age inclusion, and also age equitability in our businesses and daily life with broader ESG perspective. This mindset will really help us to do our business more responsibly and sustainably as population ages. Thank you all for joining this webinar. Together, we can redefine our attitude to our age and build a more inclusive culture. Thank you. I'm turning back to Simon again. Thank you so much, Gina. Uh, thank you for introducing us to the um, Dinkwads, by the way. I, I've, I have seen the double income with a dog in the area where I live, and, and in, by the way, in the coffee shops where I live, but I didn't know it was a hashtag. And it's clear that that is uh, an international phenomenon. We might come back to think about some of the international elements uh, in a moment. But um, in essence, I mean, I mean what, what I'm getting from you is a sense of uh, this, is, this is an opportunity 
Um, it, would you say that is shared by businesses operating from Korea or are, are some of them struggling to cope with, with all of this uh, rather big questions in front of them? Mm -hmm. So if we say, okay, is it crisis or opportunity? Still, there is more worries about, you know, aging population because, you know, government policy is not enough to support this uh, crisis. But anyway, I think some business, you know, awakened earlier, mm -hmm. they are really trying to enter this new market earlier than others, thinking forward. So uh, even though it's not really widely shared approach, I think some brands are really doing well and others will follow soon. Lovely. Okay, well, well, I think perhaps to act as a guide for us, Colin's going to pick up on your story, actually, Gina. So it's Colin in Philadelphia, uh, where it is still still morning. Uh, you have been looking at this very question, actually, haven't you, about how we can better understand senior groups. And so looking forward to your analysis. Over to you, Colin. So by now you've heard Gita talk about Gen Z, you've heard Gina talk about the older consumers. And the question you may have in your mind is, so do I go after the younger consumers or the older consumers for my particular business? Now, as Simon mentioned, most of the time, a lot of our clients do want to focus on the young. And that makes a lot of sense from quite a number of perspectives. The young, for example, uh, more likely to buy beyond the basics, meaning that if you look at this chart here, for example, they're more likely to buy entertainment, electronics, travel, vacation, across the board. So that's a lot of reasons why you might want to focus on the young. Uh, the flip side of it is if you ask older consumers about their consumer attitudes, um, you do see a tendency for older consumers to say, nah, I, I only buy the things I need and I have all I need to enjoy life. So from that perspective, again, it kind of reaffirms why you might want to focus on the young. But to go against that and to, to suggest to you, like Gina, that you may want to consider the older consumers. Uh, Gina has kind of already alluded that older consumers can have greater spending power than the young. Now, this kind of data is not very easy to come by, but we do have some data in the US we'll share with you. So in the US, as an example, uh, older adults like 59 and above, make up 27% of people, but they hold 70% of the wealth and assets. So again, that is a lot of spending power. But more importantly, this goes back to the point that Simon made. We really need to think about demography or demographics, and you need a plan for the future. And what it looks like in the future in 2050 is that one out of every five adults will be 60 and over. Now, this percentage goes up even more if you're looking at just developed countries, where by 2050, one out of every three adult will be 60 and over. So these two reasons, you know, one is that in the future, they are going to become a bigger chunk of the population. And secondly, they do seem to have more wealth and assets to spend. That really is reasons to take a second look at older consumers. But if you want to look at older consumers and if you do decide you want to target them, we're going to need to go beyond just bar charts, as Gita pointed out. You just don't want to be using bar charts of boomers versus Gen X and so on. We need to dive deeper than that. So we did a little experiment here at Epsos where we looked at older adults in four countries and we wanted to segment within the older uh, adults and we want to look to see how different they can be. And we found that indeed they can be quite different. They can be very different in terms of how they look at life, uh, they feel about their finances, and their attitudes towards consumerism. So we found four segments, uh, the names of which are on this slide here. Uh, you see simple contentment, strivers, strugglers, chill indulgence, and the names kind of conveys what each group is, but I'll talk about each segment as well. And the percentages here indicate the size, the relative size of those segments uh, when we look at the four countries combined together. Now, obviously, there, there could be differences by country in terms of those sizes, but these are the sizes of those four countries combined together. I'll start with simple contentment. Now, in terms of the outlook on life, the folks in this segment uh, tend to 
believe that they want to age gracefully. They, they see aging as something natural. They don't want to be drastic about it. They don't want to resort to cosmetic surgery to try to fight aging. Um, they want to age gracefully. When you ask them about a state of mind, they, they are calm. They are quite content with their life as it is. And perhaps not surprisingly so because they feel financially secure. So that does help feel calm. Uh, but at the same time, even though they have money, they don't feel like they need to buy more things. They want to have a simple life at this stage of their life. And finally, if you ask them, you know, what is it? Would you, what would you do if you had more time? And they will tell you that, you know, I want to exercise more because I want to be healthy. I want to age gracefully. And I want to connect with my friends and family because that is very important to me. Let's take a look at the second group uh, we call strivers. The strivers, um, unlike the simple contentment, do feel like a need to look good in public. They do want to exercise, so they're similar to the first group, but they probably want to exercise because they want to look good in public. Now, they feel financially secure, so it's just similar to the first segment, but the big difference is that buying things for them makes them happy. It makes them feel like, you know, the things they own defines who they are. And they also do admire people who own expensive clothes, cars, and homes. So it is a very different segment than the first one. The third segment we're calling strugglers. And we do so because um, this, the people in this group feel stress. Uh, they report needing mental health support. And for good reasons, um, the big reason is that they don't feel financially secure and they do worry that they don't have enough money for retirement. And at the same time, they still want, you know, the things in life that all of us want. It, buying gives them some happiness. Uh, they do admire people who own expensive clothes, cars, and homes. So it, it, it makes a lot of sense that they feel stress um, because they want to buy things, but they don't have a lot of money. And finally, the last segment here that I'll share with you, uh, we call chill indulgence. In terms of the outlook on life, this is the group that is like, whatever. Like they're not worried about how they look in public. They're not impressed by you know, people who own expensive things. And they are just relaxed, or as we call them in the US, chill. You know, They're cool. And if you ask them what do they enjoy in life, they want to eat good food, real food, not just healthy stuff. They just want to watch more TV and enjoy themselves with entertainment. And when it comes to buying things, nah, they, they would only buy what is necessary. So if you go back to the point that Gita made again, so if you, you need to dive deeper. We've looked just within the older consumers here and we found four segments. And they're very, they have very different needs. So for your particular business or service, you have to think about, you know, what is it that you can contribute to them? For simple contentment, maybe it's products or services that help them connect with loved ones to help them age gracefully. For strivers, <clears throat> any kind of product or service that help them improve their look, make them feel accomplished and elite and successful. For strugglers, even for strugglers, we can help make their life a little happier with affordable luxuries. Uh, perhaps providing service in terms of mental health support. And finally, for chill indulgence, just providing them with the things that help them enjoy the simple pleasures of life. So again, the, the main point is let's dig deeper and let's not just go with stereotypes. And with that, I'll hand it back to Simon. Well, thank you so much, uh, Colin, for providing this, this panorama for us. It's really thought provoking. Just, just to recap on the research you've done so far, so you've done four countries, and we'd be looking at the older consumers. So where are you gonna take this, this research next? So, uh, so Simon's exactly right. We've only done it for four countries. The plan is to go beyond those four countries to like another six, you know, 15 countries or so. And we want to also try to apply what we've done here to the other age groups as well, so that we can you know, make comparisons between the older consumers and the young consumers in terms of this dimension. Well, that's, I mean, and that's, um... I'm going to come back to it one more question because it comes directly to, to, to that as you as you build up this analysis across the generations because um i think one of the questions that we've, we've got here is is with some generation z moving out of home later um are they influencing their generation x or boomer parents and so i guess the more you build this analysis the more you might be able to help develop some tools for us to understand this a bit more about who's influencing who it's an excellent question. I mean, I can only speak from an old person experience. And I would say, 
yes, there likely will be some impact. Uh, mm -hmm. I can say that my, my kids are already having an impact on, on how we think. So I, I think that's a very reasonable thing. And it brings home the point that things can be very dynamic and that you have to track changes as the world changes. Yeah, no, absolutely. What, one, one other point, picking up that point about dynamism and dynamics. Um, question about population decline came through. I think, um, Jenna, you know, you showed the, the, the fertility rate falling quite sharply. And um, um, I mean, that's, you know, it feels quite dramatic. And there may be a number of things at work, presumably, because we've had COVID, we've had cost of living, uh, we've got these people making lifestyle choices. Uh, I mean, it really feels quite a uh, a sharp change and I think it was 2015 to 2022 wasn't it it was a relatively short period of time yes it actually you know the start uh, trend started from uh, 1995 but you know the, there was sharp decrease starting from yes. that period I think partly uh, partly because uh, of the impact of COVID but mostly for the rising of housing cost mm -hmm. because uh, there, there was one of the reasons why people don't get married or marry delay marriage and it also impacted you know having baby mm -hmm. so maybe it's largely due to economic factors that make people you know uncertain about the future and they delay marriage and you know having baby Mm -hmm. No, I mean, it's a real topic we have to keep so close to. I've been doing some work in the uh, in the UK, so, so Scotland is now at 1.3, and every time every time I look at these findings, I know if I see something from 2022, in some areas of research, it's fine, it's nearly up to date, but year by year, these are changing, and they're changing largely in one direction, mm -hmm. so we will have to keep an eye yeah, on I this. think one, um, of the, one of the factors is also about generation, because, you know, more younger people like Gen A and uh, millennials, they have different mm -hmm. attitude towards, you know, marriage and childbirth. That also influence, you know, low birth rate. Yeah, beyond absolutely. These economic factors. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And thinking about the back on the generations point, Gita, this is quite a big question. So, <laughs> um, um, one we could have an entire conference on this topic, but it is a very important question. I'll try and give a one right. word answer. <laughs> well, I mean, you may you may struggle actually on this one, but it, I'll, I'll read it out because it is a very important one. Should brands design uh, for life stages, or should they design targeting to specific generations? Any advice for them? See, first of all, the verdict isn't out on um, generations yet, and that's our position here because uh, mm -hmm. we do still find, uh, you know, it's a complexity of effect that explains differences. Um, if truly we were to reach a convergence where there are clear generational effects, um, then targeting generations, like I said, means locking them in for a lifetime. Uh, and, and that sounds very attractive and rational. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think that, that of, one of the points you reminded me actually preparing for this uh, webinar is around um, the fact that, um, take the example of Generation Gen Z, um, I'm guilty of perhaps always thinking of them as being terribly young, and actually they're entering their thirties. And so this this point about if not locking them in, tracking them and following them all the way through, I think is something we need to uh, really have in our in our mindsets as as they start to age, if I can say that. Um, Colin, I'm thinking about brands. Um, are we, have we observed anything on on kind of brand loyalty or orientations towards brands as we, when we're trying to think about different age groups, different generations, any observations from, from your work as, as, a, as a seasoned analyst of these things? Um, I think what we're seeing is that this is shifting in terms of brand loyalty to less brand loyalty, the, the younger you go. Um, part of that may also have to do with media consumption where you know traditionally for the older generation a lot of the media consumption was through television and certain channels that everyone watch uh nowadays it's not just television it could be anything and any blog and any video so i think there is a decline in brand loyalty i would say um that is just uh just just less of it and that, mm -hmm. that is something that i've, I've noticed 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, just thinking about um, um, one of the questions about loyalty comes back to employee loyalty. Gita, you talked about the um, workplace, and you know we'll, we'll see how these uh, younger groups, let's say, evolve as they go through the, the uh, um, their working lives. I'm going to flip let's say towards the end of people's working lives. Jenna, your example of the Starbucks barista training, I think has provoked a question or prompted a, a question because, um, uh, and that being, is that something that's being actively looked at in career to, to keep productivity levels up, either bringing people back into the workforce or extending uh, their period in the workforce? Is that an active, uh, let's say, policy or source of debate at government levels? No, it's still early stage of you know exploring the opportunity, and I think you know now 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 it's a time when you know most of boomers and now even Gen X like um, young uh, elderly Gen X is entering to retirement. So now we we'll start you know that active discussion. How this you know productive workforce will you know de uh, delay the retirement and you know act as really active working population so uh the debate we uh is now starting but it's not really still widespread trend to let them just back to work yeah yeah um, one of the questions we've had actually thinking about debates that's starting or maybe not even always be happening at least in a nuanced way is around um on the, on the political sphere so we've got questions around um about political orientations i'm speaking personally working in from our office in London, of course, we've just been through our general uh, election, and, and we saw we have seen some pretty off-the-cuff analyses of our general election, including um, the uh, Generation Z moving towards the far right in a dramatic way. Of course, the minute we look even at a few bar charts, it's not as pronounced as, as that by by any means. And I think that's again one of the uh, it's one of the areas where actually there's perhaps more information in some ways and there may be for, for brands and things over time that we can start to uh, look at how change happens uh, over time. So I think the political sphere will be quite an active area for us to research in different countries around, around, uh, around the world. Um, I'm going to come to you, Gita, um, thinking about your perspectives working, um, working um, in our India office, I mean, what's the um, how extensively used are these terms like Generation Z and Generation X in in business? Is, is that shorthand being used uh, extensively with your clients and with with the, the people you're working with? Yeah, I mean, with clients uh, in business, yes. I mean, there is a lot, and um, but <clears throat> in popular culture, not as much as you would find, let's say, in the United States or perhaps in uk and so on uh, so but but in business yes i mean uh, our clients ask us about gen z all the time yeah yeah absolutely well one one um and we're coming we're coming to the, to the end now so um we'll uh we've got a few more questions that we're gonna have to cover uh following on from from today's session so thank you everybody on the line for um for your comments and your your thoughts. Um, one of the things, just in terms of some other areas that we're going to be looking at, because we're really interested in having these discussions, you know, this whole question about where the workplace is going, I think is really critical. Um, we're of course going to be starting to try to build up the evidence base so it can find those elusive cohort effects that Gita uh, uh, referred to. One of the uh, generations that no one talks about is Generation X, uh, and potentially an under uh, researched group who have quite a lot of political power and business power because they're often the prime ministers, presidents and chief executives as well as uh, uh, having kind of economic uh, power as well. So we're going to be looking at some of those topics but really looking forward to keeping the debate going uh, and exploring these topics um, some more. So thank you so much to our great panel for uh, preparing uh, this analysis uh, for us today. Thank you again to everybody on the line. And uh, we're going to be pausing uh, because in some parts of the world, anyway, there, there are going to be some holidays, uh, I think, in August. Uh, but we're going to be pausing and coming back uh, in September, um, where we're looking at Ipsos's Global Trends uh, report. We're going to be looking back at 10 years of data. Uh, so Gita will be looking at that in detail, I know. But we're looking forward at the signals of change to help us better prepare ourselves 
uh, for uh, what's coming next. So we look forward to having you with us. I uh, do hope you can join us at our next session on the 26th. But in the meantime, the recording and the presentations and the resources will, of course, be available to you all after the webinar. So we look forward to keeping the conversation going uh, and, uh, and seeing you all again soon. All the very best. Thank you very much. Thank you.